Hello and good evening from Germany. Um, welcome back to another episode of How Do You Immerse? Today we are very honored to have a um, special guest um, joining me today, uh, Mr. Jerry Harvey, the founder of uh, Jerry Harvey Audio, um, some of the best in-ear monitors uh, in the world and um, definitely one of the most um, uh, innovative guys in this industry. He uh, has more or less single-handedly basically um, founded this industry to go into the direction that it's going today, um, has kept up with innovation and ingenuity um, over all the recent years. But not only that, um, he also has a long history as a monitor engineer with uh, some of the biggest and coolest bands in my personal opinion. Um, just to name a few, there was Linkin Park, there was Motley Crue, there was Kiss and of course Van Halen and many, many others. So um, yeah, this is going to be a very uh, interactive uh, webinar and um, just feel free to just uh, drop in all your questions um, to Jerry. Um, let's pick his brain on all things audio and all things in your monitoring and um, yeah, cool. So let's see if we can pull Jerry in. We had um, a few little internet problems, uh, problems before here. So um, in case the stream should stop, just bear with us. We will try our best to, to restart it as fast as possible. Um, we're all in our kind of home offices um, and we are depending on the gods of the internet. So um, yeah, let's hope everything works out. In case the stream should stop and we should not be able to get it back online, um, just um, go to the Klang website and we will um, um, restart it again as fast as possible. Okay, and I see that Jerry actually <laughs> just dropped out. Um, okay, that's a good start. So anybody has some good non-internet related jokes, please post them in the comments. <laughs> All right, Jerry. I think we're back. So, ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Harvey. <laughs> Jerry, are we online? Do you hear me? I think so. It's a, we have a sketchy internet thing, so this may be. <laughs> okay, let's just um, hope for the best and uh, work with it. All right. Oh, you froze again. Um, no, you're back. Fantastic. Jerry, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. How are you doing today, Phil? Good, good. Hot and sweaty because I was too stingy to install a AC in my office. That's, uh, that's kicking me right now. <laughs> but otherwise, uh, really, really good. Um, where are you at right now? Are you in, in Orlando? Yes, I'm in Orlando at the, uh, at the uh, GH Audio uh, manufacturing building. Fantastic. It's a beautiful building. Um, I had the pleasure to be there, I think, twice already. Um, it was really exciting to see how you guys are working on the in-ears and, um, um, yeah, uh, just a bunch of very, very creative people over there. Very cool. So, um, Jerry, uh, for the few people, if they should exist, that uh, don't know who you are and what you do, um, can you tell us a little bit about um, how you started in the industry? Let's, let's start at the, at the early stages when you um, became a monitor engineer. Um, who, who was the first, the first band to enjoy having you on stage left? I don't know how much they enjoyed it, but <laughs> I, was, I, was a front, I always wanted to be a front of house guy and then I started working for Tasco Sound and my first real arena monitor gig was with the, the cult in 91 on uh, i think no it was on the sonic temple tour whatever year that was so you know i was the, the low man on the totem pole they had fired seven or eight monitor engineers and i, I was fresh meat and uh and marty Hom, who's a you know very famous tour manager said uh hey jerry uh, billy wants you to be uh be the monitor engineer i'm he, he likes the way you're mixing the opening act stuff. And I'm like, well, 
I really like my job and I don't really want to be a monitor guy if I'm going to get fired. So he goes and talks to Billy and he comes back and says, Billy says, if you, if you suck at this, you can have your old job back. So <laughs> I've been a monitor engineer ever since. So there you have it. Okay, very good. So you definitely did not suck. Nice. <laughs> well, that's, I guess that's the, whose opinion you ask. I think I did a pretty good job. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Um, what was it that got you into the industry, into mixing? Was it something that fascinated you from, from an early age or did it happen, you know, how it happens with a lot of us, you know, by accident, by being in the right place at the right time? Uh, it was just a, a total coincidence. Uh, I met a guy that had a local band. I was underage. I wanted to be in the bars. I was, you know, so I helped him load in his equipment. I was the light guy, and then the sound guy quit. Then I ended up being the sound guy because, you know, that's how it happened in the in the club days. And uh, I met a couple of night of good guys around town, um, a guy named Fast Ed Bigger and a guy named Jim Egan that actually showed me the basics and got me to where I could actually put something through the PA that was, you know, palatable to listen to. But the, the simple the basics they showed me, which really helped a lot. Nice. Okay. Um, yeah. And then um, you, as you just mentioned, um, the card was one of the, the first big bands that you, that you were working with. Um, do you have any, any favorites that you, that you had worked with, you know, amongst all those bands? What was the most exciting gig that you had? I think the, the most exciting gig and the, the longest running gigs was I started working, I was a bass tech for David Lee Roth in uh starting in 87 and then i went into van halen so the van halen you know has been one way or another ran through my whole career so those are the guys that i i had a lot of fun with the cult i had a lot of fun with the other bands but dave roth and van halen you know that was they were like family and uh you know did a lot of a lot of touring with them and had a lot of fun times you know dave and i you know we were to get you know We uh, we had a lot of fun together, and then, you know, the Van Halen brothers and Mikey, but you know, Anthony and Wolfgang, all those guys were just a great bunch of people to be around. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Okay, and Van Halen actually was uh, was the, the act that kind of started the whole in your monitoring thing for you, right? Yeah, I I was hired to do uh, Alex to do the monitors for Van Halen. And that's when in-ear monitors just, you know, came to fruition and just started. And uh, I had been working for uh, an old guy, Engelbert Humperdinck, right? And a singer, he's a great guy. And we used a set of earpieces. I think I mixed on him on ears for like two months. But in that day, that made me an expert because no one else had ever, you know, it was probably three of us had done in-ears, right, at the time. Mm -hmm. So I was hired as Van Halen's monitor guy because all of a sudden I was this in-ear guy, right? Um, so we started the rehearsals and we, you know, we got the, the gear of the day, which were Garwood radio stations. And we got, there was two companies at that time that were doing in-ears. And uh, we got both sets of in-ears for, for Alex. And, um, you know, he's very, you know, we're good friends now, but, you know, I was a little bit uh, intimidated by him because he was pretty, cut and dry with his, you know, what he th thought of things. And so he puts the first set of earpieces in, uh, runs about one verse of the song, stops the song and takes them and tosses them away and say, these, these things are horrible. I can't listen to these. And I run up and I've got another set. I go, well, try these. And, you know, he puts them in and uh, runs about, an, you know, a little bit of a song and said, these things, you know, sound worse than the other ones. He goes, what do you, you know, do you not know how to mix? Because I just, you know, I was like, you know, I'm like, you know, I was always taught as a, as a, an employee of a sound company, never blame the gear, right? So uh, I was like, well, this is kind of as good as it gets. And he was, he goes, oh, listen, he goes, I want to keep doing this. And these aren't working for me. And if you're going to be the guy, you need to find something that works better for me. And that's, he left it with me. So then. I really liked working for Van Halen, you know, and I didn't want to lose that gig. So I started researching um, 
you know, miniature speakers and, and things and took about, I guess, the first set of earpieces were mediocre I built for him. And I actually made little caps that had screws on the cap. So we were blowing stuff up so much and sweating things out that I could actually like do a hot swap of the components, you know, in during the show. And I had like three backup sets and I don't, I re, I learned firsthand how to fix sweat issues, you know, what the audio uh, problems were, how the seal was, you know, affected everything. So, you know, most of this time was with me climbing up behind the drum riser during a show, getting swatted at with a drumstick, trying to change earpieces out. Right. So it was, it was very, uh, it was, a, it was, you know, jump into the deep end and, you know, swim and figure out how, how to make this thing work. And then about six months into it, um, I found, you know, I, you know, I decided I, w I needed more than one component to make these things have, be able to perform. And I found, uh, uh, I had the high driver, which was doing okay, but it had no bottom end in it. So I made a simple two way earpiece and the gentleman, Rick Zanardo that worked for Knowles called me, he goes, Hey, I've got this, this this balanced armature that's been in the balanced armature graveyard for years it's really big and it has it's made to be uh, put in people's uh, uh, um, in their chest for the pacemaker to give them a warning when they're gonna and when the thing's gonna work right so it did do 140 decibel tone through your chest cavity so when I measured it it turned into you know perfect low low mid and and uh, driver then I high passed the the other driver I had in the UE5, you know, the Ultimate Ears 5 was born, and I took him up, you know, very sheepishly to Alex. Like, I got something new for you to try, and he's and he puts him in, and he kind of gives me a smile and goes, "These are a lot better." And then I sold five sets to the opening act, you know, which was Skid Row, and I took that cash in hand. I was like, "Wow, that's twice what I make mixing." I think I'm on <laughs> something here, so. Driving along in the back of a Van Halen tour bus, we came up with the name Ultimate Ears and started my first in-ear company, Ultimate Ears, right? Fantastic, fantastic. That's that's such a cool road in there. <laughs> but uh, speaking of the, the problems with it, we actually have uh, Webby uh, <laughs> listening to us. Hi, Webby. Webby says, <laughs> everyone blames the digital console. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Did you did you it's mix on a that that was still on in, on an analog console back then I, I I assume right? Oh yeah, I was mixing. Uh, I think I was on one of Webby's uh, Heritage three Ks. One of them. I was a Midas fan. I always mixed on Midas. Mm -hmm. And then I became a very big Digico fan. And when I came out of retirement, um, Digico the D five was was just starting. Whenever I kind of got out of doing the audio for, for a living. And then, um, you know, that kind of started the, the whole digital revolution. Um, and then now, you know, you have, you know, you have the SD seven, the SD five and, you know, just amazing consoles and, and just, uh, but I'll tell you, I, I came out of retirement to do Glee, the TV show Glee. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the only way I could sell them the earpieces was if I mixed it and I didn't even know who Glee was. Right. <laughs> so I had a, uh, they had a SD seven Digico and I'm like, I don't even, I can still mix. I said, but I don't even know how to turn this damn thing on. So you have to send me a kid. Right. So they sent me out, you know, a very competent monitor engineer, Dan Horton, but he was my guy on Glee the whole time. So he mixed the band and he like set my SD seven up. So it was like, I, I could run it like an analog desk and then it kind of, uh, made, made my way through it. But I've, Every time since, and I've mixed any of the Van Halen tours or anything that I've done um, since, and I've always used a Digico. It's you know, it's as close to a digital uh, my analog desk as I've ever seen. Nice, nice. Um, when we when we spoke before, you you mentioned that um, the one of the last big tours that you did was uh, five years ago with with Van Halen. You so you still have a strong connection to those guys, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah, I. I I finished, uh, I didn't finish up the tour. That was, I've done every Van Halen tour since 95, except for I think 07, I couldn't do because of Ultimate Ears. Um, but about halfway through the tour, I trained, uh, I trained Miles Hale and he came in and, and took over for me. I just don't have the, 
I don't have the stamina to be out on a tour bus and to do that, even though my gig was pretty easy. It's just, and I'll tell you what, you know, it's a, as you get older, the adrenaline rush from the house lights going down, down, you know, it used to be like, wow, I can't, you know, wait to get into this. And at the end, it was like every time the house lights would go down, I was like a little bit of anxiety. Like, I hope everything just gets, I hope I make it to the end with no tragic failures, right? You know? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's. I guess that's that's a part of the charm of the of the job on stage right, right? Uh, stage left, I mean, or oh, wherever. That's the drug. Yeah, the house <laughs> lights go. <laughs> nice, nice. So, um, yeah, so so all that inspired you basically to just uh, go ahead with all the development of of of, of Inish. So, as you mentioned before, um, the first um, attempts were basically with a, with a dual driver, and from there you started professionalizing it and actually, um, you know starting a company that that, that actually uh, does the, the the production and the manufacturing and the design and all this stuff um which which do you have any um any big points in the in the history of of how you uh developed in years that were big game changers for you in terms of um, new technologies or in terms of new ways to fit them together or something like that there's been a you know kind of it's kind of like a domino effect you know, you continue to develop product and you make small, small changes. And over the years, they add in, up into big changes. The, um, but I think the, you know, the UE, the Ultimate Ear 7 was the first earpiece that I designed that would actually hold up to the dynamic range and had enough SPL headroom before it distorted. And that was a very simple dual low, single high. And that, that that piece was kind of like set the set the bar for what it, how an earpiece had to perform right because as soon as I launched the seven, all the distortion problems everybody seemed to be happy and there's still people to this day that still love that 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 earpiece because it it's still the you know got the most headroom and the loudest freaking earpiece on the planet you know so uh, it wasn't meant to be loud but it was meant to have headroom and dynamic range but. Mm. Um, and then the next, the next, there's two more developments that, that happened that changed the way I manufacture in-ear monitors. And the one was the last piece that I made, uh, the UE11. I figured out how to make a sub bass um, with, you know, because you can't really do a low pass in an ear, in-ear monitor because the inductor has such a high impedance that it turns the driver down. So if you wanted to do a 200 hertz, you know, low pass roll off, if, if the inductor has so much impedance that it turns the driver down where it's not usable. So I figured out a way to do band passes and with a, a couple of different techniques and that made the first three-way earpiece, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what made the 11 kind of stand out from the, the five and the seven and you know how most people these days tune the bass flat. It allowed me to do like that sub bass punch and allow it to, to, to roll into the low mids by creating that that you know that sub basically sub bass driver and adding it to a kind of a flat earpiece already so that was that would be one of the things that i still carry into every product i develop now we still do that that band pass and different slopes but we still you know from the layla to the roxanne um 13 every earpiece i manufacture now has that has had that tech that has that technique involved um the other thing was that i just everyone started complaining about, not complaining, questioning how much bass response an earpiece had. They never asked, what did the mid sound like? How, what's the top end extension? It was always, how much bass response is tuned into this earpiece? So that's when I started using uh, four pins and I broke off the low drivers and put an attenuator in the cable so you could set the, the bass at whatever level you like. So that stopped that question. And then the last thing in the current iteration of how in-ears are made was basically uh, time aligning the freak phase, basically doing impulse times on all the drivers and then physically putting them in time so there's no phase cancellation at the crossover point. So, you know, we do, we do every earpiece we make is fa are, are phase correct, which when you're dealing with a clang world, the more phase correct the headphone or the earpiece is, 
the more of a good representation you get of the 3D imaging. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Um, by the way, we have um, Kyle commenting. I think we locked uh, I think up. You, you, you know Kyle as well. Um, he says, uh, UE7s are uh, still of, uh, one of my favorite pieces. I have a set 10 years old and only replaced cables. So, nice. I guess I did my job in 1998. <laughs> well, and I you love continued. That piece. Mm -hmm. No, I love that piece. And we're actually thinking about bringing it back at JH Audio as kind of like an entry level piece because, because not to plug the company, but it's still. I mean, you know, this gentleman has had this thing 10 years and replaced the cable on it. It's a robust piece. It's, it's really kind of a flat frequency response earpiece. It doesn't have a bunch of bottom end tuned into it. So it, it really does a good job. So, you know, we kind of put it in the, put it in the graveyard. Now we're kind of like, you know, you're going to fish it out and bring it back, I think. Nice, nice. That's good to hear. Um, oh, nice. Some family coming in. Jamie says hi. <laughs> um, and we have a comment, a question from Taylor. Um, when are you going to also have the pod to tune the treble into mods? I assume it's mids. Um, guys are making custom cables where you can alter not only the lows, but the mid highs. I don't, yeah. we're never going to do that on a cable. I, I work very hard at the crossover points in the relation to the mid and the high uh, tuning. And there's going to be future developments where we're going to have so much more control over everything instead of just being able to turn a crossover point up and down. Ooh, interesting. Very cool. Okay. Nice. Um, everyone watching, um, keep firing your questions. Um, we're happy to answer all of these um, or most of these, depending. <laughs> um, in the meantime, um, yeah, I think you also developed aviation headsets for a while, right? Yeah, I, you know, I became a pilot. So when I left Ultimate Ears, I had to take a little, I had to sit on the sidelines. So I thought, wow, I was so, I did very well with the music earphones. You know, I'm going to go do have the same success as aviation in aviation. And it was a dismal failure. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, um, they were great headsets, but come to find out pilots don't like to spend money. So that, you know, it was a physical <laughs> failure, you know? So then in 09, we, we started back in music and then JH audio actually became, you know, a, a profitable company. In 09, we started launched the, the 13, which was the first, uh, three way dual low, dual mid, dual high, six driver earpiece. And the audio files really loved that earpiece. So, um, HeadFi, Jude from HeadFi helped me out and, you know, said Jerry Harvey's back. No one knew who I was. They knew Ultimate Ears. And, uh, and then um, in uh, May of, of 2009, I went out to a little trade show in L.A. I had a, a plastic table and a set of earpieces and some foam tips. And I went back, you know, I was losing money hand over fist trying to make aviation. And um, I went to the mailbox after it went out online, I had like 250 pair of impressions sitting there, you know, you know, stuffed into our, into our box. Like all of a sudden, all these impressions started showing up, and I, you know, we became a music company. And it took about about another year for the professionals to come back. And it wasn't until I developed the 16 that had a little bit more low end punch in it that the pros came back, and then. Then the 16 became kind of the industry standard for a while, and that, that led to the, the pros trusting me and uh, kind of realizing, you know, what my what I had done before and kind of stuck with me from that point on. Fantastic. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting little side tour um, that you did there, but very cool. Hey, there's uh, more questions coming in. This one is coming from the In-Ear Monitor International Trade Organization. I guess uh, Mike Diaz is behind that. Hi, buddy. How are you doing? Um, let's, get, uh, let's give credit where credit is due by playing two degrees <laughs> of Jerry Harvey. I can name the, the ones that I am at. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, okay, there's a question uh -huh. from Webby coming in. 
How does an old audio geezer with waxy ears get the shit out of his rock sands? Very pragmatic question. <laughs> it's, called, it's called a Jody vac. Webby, hit me up and we'll send you one so you can get the head cheese out of those things. Solutions. I love it. Very nice. <laughs> so to answer the other question, the other companies that were involved with me were West Tone and um, Ultimate Ears and JH Audio. Those are the three companies that, that I've been involved with. Yep. And uh, yeah, I guess everyone who is in our industry knows all of those very well. So that is quite exciting. And that's um, one of the reasons why I was very excited to have you in our, in our webinar today. Um, because I don't think there's a lot of people who have that much insight into the development of in-ears. And we'll get back to, to, you know, the history, present and future of in-ears in a little bit. But first, let's see, uh, there's a couple of other questions. Marcus is here and he's asking, what was the most bizarre project or most challenging request from a customer? Do you have anything in mind there? Yeah, we... Uh for um, oh, um, T-Pain, we actually made a set of in-ear monitors out of shotgun shells. That was pretty bizarre. <laughs> wow, he must have big ears. <laughs> he, yeah, well, there were four ten shells, but yeah, we basically made the cap, the, the you know, the face plate. I looked at him for a couple of days and tried to figure out how the hell to do that, and we we finally pulled that off. And you know, the other challenging things that we deal with on a daily basis is trying to compensate for hearing loss and things like that. So we, you know, we're pretty active in trying to, to within reason of what we can do with a passive crossover, help people that have, you know, moderate hearing loss out with, you know, we'll, we'll get their audiogram. And so that's kind of the, a, a challenging thing, but also very gratifying when somebody can hear, you know, use the product and hear better with it, right? That's that's fantastic. By the way, just just a question from that uh, from 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 my side here. Um, do you how do you come up with with new ideas or new designs? Um, do you have like um, a way that you do it? I mean, for example, our very own uh, John Stadius from from the, from Digico. I know that he goes fishing a lot, and you know while fishing he gets all the ideas for the next best mixing board. Um, do you have? like a process or something like that, that inspires you to, to go on? It's pretty organic. I, I never stop thinking about this little niche, you know, like it's, I'm pretty consumed with it. I feel that the current, in the passive world and just configurations of, of you know, pushing the products like, I think that, okay, let me, let me back up. So, you know, the first there was a the dual driver, then we had the triple, and then we had the quad. And then we, I started using quad drivers to be able to manipulate the crossover network, right? So, you know, it was kind of a slow transition, but then by having four drivers, I can wire them in series, I can wire them in series parallel, I can, you know, um, in our parallel, and I can change how, how they react in the crossover network. But I feel that presently, We've hit the end of the road with the, you know, what are you going to do? Put 18, 16? I mean, it's not about how many drivers you can stuff in a shell anymore. I think going forward is going to be what you can do with less and what you have more control over the components. Um, so the things that I'm thinking about now on the technology side is complete control over this over the circuit. Um, then that helps out with the cling, you know, because all of a sudden we're going to have very efficient earpieces that are perfectly tuned. You can change the way this thing sounds by re reflashing the thing. So we're going to enter into the next few years into a totally different um, realm of how in-ear monitors are done. The days of how many drivers can you shove into a, into a shell are pretty much over, right? And then the other thing for our company, obviously since the professional business has been outlawed, you know, you, you know, it's, you know, they've outlawed concerts and, you know, the COVID virus and all of this craziness and, you know, rightly so, but we're leaning a little bit more on our, on our audiophile um, business. And we've created normally um, in-ear monitors are done with a ultraviolet 
um, curing, whether it's an SLA machine or whether you're using a light to make the shells. And they're pretty fragile, really. I mean, you could, if you don't have a faceplate on it, you could take any UV shell and cr crush it like, you're, like a potato chip, right? When you put the faceplate on it, you know, it makes it more sturdy, gives it structural. But what we've started doing is we've started making, um, we're the first company that's figured out how to CNC custom shells, right? So what we've been doing is we've been manufacturing shells out of like light milled car lightning strike carbon fiber, carbon fiber, woods and resins out of wood. And it's, it's created a, another depth and another strength of, of the in-ear monitor. So um, we're hoping by July 1st, the second week of July, to be almost 100% milled shells instead of SLA shells. And even the resin shells that we make that are milled are substantially stronger and they're crisper and cleaner. So on the, the fit and finish side, we're moving completely to 100 almost 100% milled shells, um, no matter whether it's whatever is clear, whether it's black, whether it's you know wooden. So it's given it a different fit, finish, and it's going to increase the um, the durability of a set of earpieces. I mean, you can drive a truck over the milled carbon fiber ones. I'll, I'm actually going to do a video of burning out on a set and putting <laughs> picking them up and putting them in my ears. I'll watch. I'll do that. Yeah. Oh, nice. I'm looking forward to that. Okay. That's that's a that's a really interesting uh, roadmap, I would say. Very very cool. Um, let me see. We have a couple of uh, other questions. Oh, and one comment. I think that's nice to see from Alexei from Russia. Um, huge thanks to Jerry for the best IEMs. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Um, all right. Um, there is another question from uh, from Taylor. Let me just move that. Oh, sorry, I'm just blocking your face a little bit here. Um, how does JH Audio decide when to use okay. a balanced armature versus a dynamic versus a miniature electrostatic transducers? Any word on the development of the Janus or uh, an electrostatic uh, earphone in general? Oh, wait, my screen is blocked here. In general, from JH Audio. Yeah, so, you know, I kind of gave a little bit of a peek. Uh, about a year ago in Southeast Asia of how the my future looks as far as the the, the processors that I want to use for in-ear monitors. Um, and deciding when to use a balanced armature or a dynamic driver or electrostatic, um, balanced armatures are the go-to because they have input sensitivity, they have gain. I can in a passive crossover world, you have you can only turn things down, you can't turn things up. So balanced armatures, you know, for their size, they have the most headroom and dynamic range. That being said, dynamic drivers have lower input sensitivity, so you actually have to use them as the starting point. So in a live environment, dynamic drivers don't really do a great job for live performance on the lows because they're, the low driver is setting the input sensitivity and the and the the gain of that earpiece. And you you know with a when you're talking about a console, you're talking about a transmitter, and you're talking about an earpiece, they all have to be kind of in unity gain because you don't want to be driving the transmitter and driving the desk because you have a quiet earpiece, right? They all have to be kind of unity gain. So I never use dynamic drivers on the lows because if I use dynamic drivers for a low speaker you're going to have to drive the console and the bell pack everything way too hard because instead of 118 dB uh, earpiece, you're talking about maybe 105 or 108 dB. And the lows are always more or higher in a, in a PA system. Any, anything that has a musical tone to it, the low, low end is going to be at least 6 dB to 8 dB hotter. So if you're starting at you know, 105 dB, your mids are down at 99. And I'm not saying that, that that's if you're running it on stun, but I'm saying you have to have unity gain across the earpiece. So the only earpiece that I've designed um, for live use, I've used the dynamic drivers for mids because they're 108 dB. I still can have a bass bump. And uh, you know the guitar players are liking that, like slashing it. And the difference is, is that I feel that dynamic drivers reproduce mid frequencies better than they reproduce low end frequencies in an in-ear monitor. Um, because you need the horsepower of the balanced armatures to get the bass punch, 
you get the tonality of the of the mids so the drum the snare drum the guitar it's very sympathetic to like a distorted marshall the balanced armatures they do a good job but a dynamic does the best if you really want to get down to it as far as recreating the actual distortion in a marshall cabinet or the tonality of a you know a box cabinet mm. and then the top end the dynamic drivers you know just don't have the top end extension balanced armatures have a fairly good top end extension to rolling off 14 16 and then you bring in the electrostatic now the electrostatic is an amazing broad you know high frequency driver that goes way out past 20 almost to 40k unfortunately in a passive earpiece it's not usable because the electrostatic driver even if you double them up is so quiet that it's even quieter than a dynamic so you have to bring everything down to be in alignment with the electrostatic and it'd be okay if you're sitting in the quiet room listening to your vinyl, but it's not going to work in a live environment. Mm -hmm. So, but in the future, we will be using electrostatic drivers and dynamics in a more, more robust way, but it's going to take, you know, you're, it's going to take amplification. You can't do it in a passive. So it's, it's an active circuit is the only way you're ever going to see uh, an electrostatic high frequency driver um, able to work in a live environment. Wow, that was okay. I just learned a lot. Very cool. Hey, Taylor, I hope that that question is answered to your satisfaction. Um, thanks for getting back to us. Um, there is um, another question from, from Jordan. Let me pull it up. Here we go. So where do you see the future of shell customization? And do you think shell customization is more important to the customer than the amount of drivers that you can fit into the device. It's an interesting question. I think it's it's um, pointing towards, um, you know, the, the consumer clients that you have to, who are not playing on stage and not not musicians and, and sound engineers. Well, okay, shell customization for our company is going to be off the off the charts. I mean, that's we're putting a lot into the fit and finish. I mean, if you look at some of the earpieces that we've done for the rock stars, like Duff McKagan, if you look at our Instagram, you'll see we milled a set of earpieces out of, of we did a copper faceplate, we milled his, his skull logo into it, we patinaed it, and then we did a, a custom patina shell that has a patina green with, with uh, copper residue in it, right? You know, the pop stars love cool stuff too, you know? Our audiophile market, they like they like the, the fit and finish. But um, I think that the fit and finish and durability of the earpiece, like I was saying, and I keep going back to the milled shells, whether it's a resin shell that's a clear shell or it's made out of lightning strike carbon fiber, um, it's a much, much more durable piece. And that our our you know, our customization of uh, materials we can use from Damascus to Damascus to carbon fiber to wood to resin, you know, come on, let's have some fun with it. I mean, we're making jewelry for men, basically, you know. And, uh, but, you know, a lot of the artists do a lot of artwork. So it's not just strictly the, um, it's not strictly the, um, the consumer base that are, are upgrading the shells and buying signature series stuff. And then I think I've already answered as far as the driver configuration, you know, we're, we're going to try to get more out of less rather than add more to the to the components because I think we've pushed the the envelope of of what we can do with the passive you know we can do different audio signatures we can tune it differently we can you know but the the balanced armature development has hit the end of the I think we've pushed it I've pushed it as hard as I can to get as much out of those little guys as possible right mm. that makes sense Nice. Um, okay. Okay. Our audience is on fire. There's a lot of questions coming in. I love it. Very nice. Um, okay. Taylor. Um, Aya Salola. I compared your entire line to UE64 audio and Westone flagships and an audio convention and landed on the Lola's as my favorite. Amazing piece. So, just a nice comment. From, Thank you. Um, Okay, let me let me just um, check this out real quick. There is there's one question here from Harold. Harold. Um, a while ago, Westone got a 
product that added mics to the cable to introduce ambience audience response. Other manufacturers used ports which uh, severely affected the frequency response of the earpiece. Does Jerry Harvey Audio have any ideas to address introducing audience response and local ambience into the signal that is not via crowd mics placed on the side of the stage? Interesting question. I'm not a big fan of ambient mics because it creates a time smear. Um, so that's definitely off of the off the off the uh, the table. And when I was at West Home, we experimented with you know ambient mics and everything. Um, we used a little Mackie mixer. Then they made a processor. Then I know that Michael from Santu, uh, Michael from Sensophonics has a little ambient processor. Um, I'm hoping at some point, you know, if you look at our our connections, we have seven pins, so we're going to be able to use that. In the near future, we don't have an ambient piece as far as uh, with um, with my active microphones, but that will be in our in our future. I would say in the next five years, we'll develop that, and we're. The DSP is getting too powerful enough that you can actually make those microphones sound natural. Before they always sounded like hearing aids. It was really hard unless you had an equalization circuit to get those earpiece. Even the flat little uh, little cylinder mics that that are made, you know, you you have to shape it to sound like the outside world. It, it just it just doesn't sound natural. Mm. And over the years, I vented every earpiece I could, and you know, there's no free lunch. If you if you put a vent into uh, an in-ear monitor, the only way you're getting any bass is through bone conduction. As soon as you break that seal, you're going to lose bottom end. So I've tuned, I've, I've actually started using bigger vents and to try to add bass to the, to the earpiece. I think we call it the ambient FR just to make the light, at least the bottom end flat, you know, so it's usable. Um, I understand why people want ambient. I mean, as a monitor engineer, if I'm going into a festival, it's gonna, you know, probably not. People aren't gonna like me saying this. I'd rather do a throw and go on wedges and side fills than do ten in ear mixes out of the gate anytime, you know, because it's it's easier. You're just add filling in what people are missing on the deck, right? Mm -hmm. With in ears, it's pretty. You have to be pretty precise with your mix. Now, I've also experimented with earpieces that have absolutely no seal at all. And basically, they're only they're basically like mids and high frequencies for your head. But what you do there, you actually you actually use the wedges for the low mids, right? And I've done it um, at Bette Midler, Richie Sambor, and a bunch of other people, Julio Iglesias. I've made these like skeleton pieces, and basically they just add kind of the Christmas at the ear. You put a, you know five to ten mil a second of pre-delay to kind of put them in time with the wedges, and you know, the, the problem with that is, is if you lean on the bell pack and all of a sudden you have this tinny sound in your head. So, you know, and every artist, as soon as the house lights go down, start turning things up. So you have to turn the whole mix up together. You just can't like, you know, bump the bump the earpiece up. So that works for a very educated monitor engineer that, you know, can communicate with their artists. But it's not something I would put out there for the general population to use. Mm -hmm. Right. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right. Um, there's another question from Kevin. Uh, he's saying, where do you see um, stage monitoring in 10 years from now? What would change? Less wedges, more IEM, all immersive with tracking, which I like. Um, wireless IEMs. Um, do you have any, any like, like crazy ideas? You know, not, not just stuff that is already in your head and that's basically a natural progression, well, but you know, like really a future side for that. I, I think that we're going to continue to see less wedges, even though I'm still a big wedge fan. Um, um, I think if you look at the trend from 93-ish, whenever in-ears came in, to now, the early adopters were singers and then drummers. You know, a lot of people in the old days when I started didn't want to put things in their ears. Um, now, like the third generation of musicians, it's, you know, instead of going and looking for wedges, they just go buy in-ears. So it's become... I think that in-ears aren't going anywhere, They're, you know. Um, I think that the in-ears will be doing a lot more. I mean, you know, already we're putting sensors in for tracking, lighting, you know, we do infrared, you know, it's why I have seven conductors, you know. Uh, we're working with you, you know, to do the, your sensors for this to spin around on the stage. Um, so I see that in-ear monitors, it's going to be a long time before an in-ear monitor 
is truly wireless like Bluetooth because it takes a lot of horsepower to drive an in-ear monitor in a, in a live environment. Um, until they find something like Bluetooth that doesn't have 30 or 20 or 30 milliseconds of latency. I mean, we can, we can shoot Bluetooth to a Bluetooth earphone all day, but you'll never be able to sing in time because the latency is so long. So until the, some wireless link brings the latency down, I think we're pretty much, you know, conf confined to, to a transmitter receiver and a hardwire to the head. Mm. Cool. Um, Let's, let's talk a little bit about um, Clang. I mean, the, the, the focus of, of today's conversation is mostly just to pick your brain, but um, we know each other since um, a while, I would say, um, in Clang's perspective as a very young company. Um, yeah. Before, before we, we got in touch, uh, did you have any, any connection points or any, any, um, any things to do with, with immersive audio? Do you remember what was the first things in terms of immersive audio that happened? that would spike your interest? Um, I think that Kling was actually the first unit that I played with that actually did the job. I can't remember the name. There was one, you know, probably a decade ago that didn't do a very good job. And before that, it was called the, there was a stereo and an imager called the Bendini Audio Spatial Environment, the base unit. And I used that to really screw up my, uh, I did that on Engelbert and I really screwed up my gain structure, you know, it was like, but, uh, but the thing about Kling, what I like is, you know, you guys nailed the imaging in, in the earpieces in your head or headphones, whatever you're using. And I really like, you know, we've been working in a stereo world for so long. And to be able to, to take that image and even move it a little bit out or a little bit back or a little bit forward gives you so much more space in the mix. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of it. You know, if I was still an active monitor engineer, I would definitely be using that, you know, to open up my mixes. Um, and I think now that, you know, you're going to, the new engineers, the new kids that are coming up that are going to be into this. I mean, you have, you know, you're also starting to get this with the L acoustics you're doing that with, they're doing it with PA systems. So you're doing it for the ears. So, you know, everybody is thinking about now imaging things out of left and right. So, and for me, it, you know, listening to it and playing with it, I feel that there's going to be less ear fatigue. You're going to have a lot more depth in the mix. Mm -hmm. I think you'll be able to turn the overall gain of the mix down because you're hearing clearly, you're hearing through the mix. Absolutely. And now that, you know, it's integrated, it can be integrated into the digital consoles. I think the new, the new engineers, you know, the up and coming kids that are going to adopt this, both the L Acoustics uh, PA version and the, the Kling version, um, you're going to see huge traction, and I think this is going to be the way of the future that people are actually going to mix in ears. And I think that will also answer some of the ambient issues of not feeling so cooped up, right? You know, to go back, you know, now you have earpieces that have frequency response out to 16K. You have the claim system that can give you space. You know, every time you open a microphone on stage, you hear ambient noise. So it's not like you're feeling, you're like sealed off. The old days you were sealed off because there was no high frequencies over 5K in the earpiece, so it sounded like this, mm -hmm. why all the manufacturers put high frequency boost in. But you take a high performance uh, phase correct earpiece or headphone, you take the clang, you take the digital processing of the, the, the Digico consoles, and you know, I think that that's gonna be a very, very pleasing experience you know, for, the, for, the, for the pop star, the end user. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's pretty much the feedback that we're getting from from people who are using exactly that combination. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it, you, what what you mentioned about you know um, um, uh, face corrected in ears and 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 uh, having a, a high frequency range that is where um, an IEM system like like the Clang system can shine. You know, so the more um, the more quality you get in terms of transient response and high frequency response and general um, being able to hear everything that you're sending into it, which is not happening everywhere. Um, that's where the placement and all that stuff is happening exactly how you want to have it. Um, and um, actually what, what you mentioned with the, with the ambience mics, that's something we're getting a lot. Um, that this is now um, uh, the first time that, that you can leave the ambience in the mix all the time. You don't have to ride the fader, you know, to clean up the mix because you don't get those 
mudding up and those um, um, yeah those, those those weird cross effects between microphones that are in different uh, distances from from a source. So yeah, yeah so that's why it's a match made in heaven. I would say. Now I now I have a question for you. Oh, so please. have you noticed that that you know because. The reason that I stopped using ambient mics was because of the time smear, being so late, you know, and everything's, the mics are, in, like you said, in different time ranges. So have you noticed that if you have ambient mics in different places around the stage, that by positioning different in the ear mix, that you don't seem to have the time smear as much? Absolutely. And not only for, for, for ambience mics, actually. That, that is true for all open mics on the stage. Um, a, a very good example would be... Um, for example, if the drummer hits the snare drum, that's a quite loud um, impact on the stage, right? And you have the snare mic, you have the tom mics, you have the overheads, then you have, you know, the, the mic on the guitar cabinet, all the oh, singer's right. mics. Yeah. So you're getting that snare into, let's say, 15 to 20 mics with different uh, distances. So the same impact, the same transient hits in, in 20 different times, which just creates a comp filter if you are using it in stereo. And that is what we feel as muddiness. Yeah. While as soon as they are spread around the head in different positions, and it doesn't even matter if it's the positions, how they are really on stage, or if they're just spread out to have like a wide and open mix. Um, the only thing that happens is that your brain interprets that as, um, you know, them being a little bit farther apart than they are actually positioned. Um, so if you would measure it, you would still see those comp filter effects, but the brain actually cleans that up and knows exactly which part belongs where, and you don't get that as a negative effect anymore. And the same thing happens, of course, for ambience mics in the same, uh, in the same way. So yes, absolutely. Long answer for a simple question. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. <laughs> All right. Hey, let's see if there's a, a couple of other questions in there. There's one from uh, Jordan. How long does it take for you to mill a pair of uh, resin IEMs uh, using your CNC? From the time we do the the actual mill time um, is about two hours per pair. Okay, that's quite fast. Nice. Yeah, but there's but there's some you know there's some work going on behind the scenes that takes some time, like the tool pass and figuring you know, got to shape the shape the impression and figure out the tool pass and you then you you know there it's it's a little lot more it's a lot more labor, but it's a much better end result. Mm -hmm. I see. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, we are getting close to an hour, actually. Time is flying. Um, so um, before we uh, start wrapping this up, um, people, if you have any further questions, uh, now would be a great time to ask them. Um, in the meantime, do you have any, any tips or tricks for people who are now just starting to consider in-ears? Um, no matter if it's, you know, musicians who are playing since a long time already and they just want to make the switch from, from wedges to IEMs or um, people who are just starting in the industry and who are, you know, starting to, to, uh, to research on what are the best pieces of in-ears that, that they should use. I remember that when, when, when I um, wanted to, to, to buy my first in-ears, there were so many differences out there and I had no clue what it was and why more drivers might be better or might be not better. And um, do you have any like, like quick tips and tricks that would be interesting for people to just find the best in your for themselves? Um, I, I think you, you have to, you have to listen. You have to listen to the earpieces if at all possible, you know, Call the company, see if they'll send you some demos out. Go to a trade show. I mean, when we start having trade shows again, uh, take advice from you know, you, you know, look at what the professionals are using. You know, if um, you know, if Lady Gaga or this this artist, your favorite artist, or whatever song genre you have, if it's working for them live, you know it'll work for you live, right? So, pretty much all in in ears within reason or, or good audio quality these days. So you're not going to have a problem, but like I said, you know, kind of do your research, see what the pros are using. If you're a musician, you know, if you're an audio file, you're just going to have to listen and choose whatever audio signature you like. Um, but I think the number one tip that I have for anybody that's a singer, a monitor engineer or starting on trying to make it comfortable for your artist uh, to be able to sing with a set of veneer pieces is that 
you have to deal with what's called the, the, uh, the occlusion effect. Basically, when you put your fingers in your ears, you have low mids in your, in your voice and, and a resonance in your skull that become predominant because all of a sudden you shut off all the, you know, you're not hearing your mouth through your ears anymore. All you're hearing is this low muffled, low mid and low in your skull. So what people do a lot of times is they'll take a microphone, a vocal microphone, they won't high pass it, and they'll put it into a set of earpieces that have a lot, you know, series, you know, you're sealed up and everything sounds muffled. And what ha you have to do is you have to get enough gain if you leave it flat to overcome the head resonance, your, you know, your, your head voice, you know. You've seen singers over the years, they, you know, like the Bee Gees guy, he would, every time you can see he was trying to pitch, he'd put his finger in his ear because he'd listen to his head voice. Well, what you do with an in-ear monitor is you basically, I always, anybody that's a singer, I basically high pass an in-ear, the microphone at 250 to 400 hertz. I'll wipe all those low mids out and I'll, I'll have them sing and I'll have them turn up the, I'll get, you know, unity gain on them, get them gain on the mic and I'll have the artist just sing at a normal, you know, no, normal level and have them turn up the bell pack until it comes clear and the, the, the earpiece all of a sudden blends with their head voice. So it's, you know, then what I'll do also is I will duplicate that channel and send it without that much of a high pass to the rest of the band, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, the thing that people don't understand is that head voice will really mess with a set of in-ears and you'll actually drive them harder and louder than you need to if you don't, if you, don't you know, get that, that uh, occlusion, those frequencies out of, out of that microphone when you're feeding it back to the, to the artist. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, that's that's a that's a very very good one. Nice. Okay, there's um, a question oh, from our very own Roman. Um, as a former touring sound engineer, do you still enjoy attending big rock concerts? And if so, do you prefer to stand in the audience, get a spot in front of house for the PA sweet spot, or with a spare backpack near the monitor console? Interesting question. Well, I prefer to be at the front of house. Because for all the years that I did monitors, you never get to, to have the impact of what the total production looks like, the lights, the video. You know, you're, you're standing at the side of the stage. Now, I spend a lot of time on the side of the stage with a belt pack, and I like listening to, my, to the engineer's mix and what the artists are listening. But for me, you know, I want to be in the front of house area where it sounds the best in the room. I want to feel my pants legs move. I want to see the lights. I want to see, I want to get the whole the whole the whole package you know what i mean that's what i like the most so i still love going to concerts you know and mm. yeah you know i saw electric light orchestra and that that i sat in the seats as a punter you know and it was probably one of the best shows i've ever seen it was like you know it was like everything was on point it was great you know fantastic well, I hope we can we can go to concerts very very soon again. Um, I think we all miss it quite a bit, no matter in which spot of the of the venue. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. Hey, um, Jerry, um, thank you so much for your time. That was really really interesting, and um, actually I learned quite a bit myself. So, thank you for that. Um, thank you everyone who tuned in. Thank you for all your questions. Um, if you should remember any questions later, just feel free to just send us a message. Um, Get in touch with, uh, with the JH guys, um, check out their website, check out their products. And once we can go to, to trade shows again, um, make sure to just listen to, the, to those uh, fantastic products. All right, um, cool. Jerry, thank you very much. Take care and uh, Thanks, hope Bill. to Appreciate see you very, very soon uh, once we can all travel again. I hope so too. Thanks for having me, I greatly appreciate it. Everybody have a great day or night. Thank you, see you, bye. Here's bye.